Welcome everyone. I'm here with Vince Cerf, who probably needs no introduction, but he's a member of the Internet Hall of Fame and the chief internet evangelist at Google, and much more importantly, is the one of the big fathers uh, of the internet. And I've made it my habit when I'm in Vince's presence to begin every conversation and invite everybody else in the vicinity to say thank you. So I start by saying thank you. Well, uh, remember, you're thanking probably by this time millions of people who have both made the internet what it is and the World Wide Web that rides on top of it and also makes it work today because this is, doesn't run by itself. There it's is a, a mighty great, thing. A lot of work that goes into making this thing uh, do what it needs to do. And of course, there's, we'll talk about some of those things because it's getting even more challenging. I thought to um, maybe introduce folks to what you're um, currently doing, just to add to your credentials. I wonder if you could talk about what you're working on now and in the coming months and uh, you know how you're spending the majority of your time. Well, uh, certainly one thing which is top of mind is the Internet Governance Forum, which has been going on since 2006. I have been asked by the Secretary General of the UN to chair the Internet Governance Forum's leadership panel which works together with the uh, multi-stakeholder advisory group, not only to help organize the annual meeting, but also to promote the outcomes of the previous meetings in venues where uh, they might not normally have uh, heard about what the IGF has to say about the uh, operation and use of the internet today, the risk factors and the responses to that. So that's a very busy thing. I'm heading to Riyadh next week uh, to meet with the team um, in preparation for the uh, annual meeting of the IGF, which will be in Riyadh in Saudi Arabia in December. Uh, the other, th Another thing which is on my plate uh, is the Digital Crime Treaty, which is being negotiated between the US uh, the, uh, and uh, Europe and many other uh, countries around the world. Uh, and there, the effort is complex because there are many crimes that people commit that just incidentally happen to be done over the internet. But fraud, for example, is already a crime. You don't need a special crime for committing fraud on the internet. Uh, and so the problem is how to tease out in this discussion those crimes which couldn't be committed without benefit of the uh, use of the internet and to specialize and focus on that as opposed to every possible crime, uh, many of which are already on the books. So there's a lot of arm wrestling about that. There's also a lot of arm wrestling about uh, protecting people's rights and to have due process. This gets very complicated, especially in the context of privacy, because uh, the, one of the problems we have in the internet environment is that the kinds of harms that could occur are transjurisdictional. Uh, a victim could be in one country and the perpetrator in another. And in order for that to be dealt with, for parties to be held accountable, there has to be cooperation between the states. And that's part of what the argument is about. Do both states agree that a particular action is a crime? Second, are they willing to cooperate to help track down the parties that are responsible and, and hold them accountable? So this is an important discussion. It's been put on pause just recently, and that's a good thing in my view, because there are still many dangling participles that need to be resolved. So that's consuming some of my time. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't say that artificial intelligence and machine learning and large language models uh, also uh, loom large on the plate, especially when we start thinking about how these uh, tools can uh, be both used and abused. They are powerful tools. They are strikingly capable of uh, generating uh, content, but they also are uh, quite uh, glib at generating misinformation and disinformation. They can conflate facts to produce counterfactual output. And the reason that this is a little alarming is that sometimes it's hard to tell. Uh, you may have heard stories about, um, uh, I guess one attorney used a chatbot to generate a pleading to the judge and the chatbot made up a reference which didn't exist. And I can tell you that the judge was not pleased uh, or impressed by this attorney's pleading as a result. So we have a lot of work to do, both to understand why and how these things happen, and second, how to detect them, and third, how to try to inhibit or reduce the likelihood that the output will be uh, incorrect. So uh, the funny thing is that these tools are also uh, quite powerful when it comes to entertainment. 
Um, I, I asked one chatbot to just write a story about an alien that invaded my wine cellar and was consuming my Cabernet Sauvignon. And it wrote a nice little funny thousand word story about this alien. And, and it was all very amusing. And now that was innocuous uh, because it, well, nothing, no one was depending on that. But if you were to ask it to give you a medical diagnosis or financial advice, now you're up in high risk territory. And so the question is, how do we rank order the risks and how do we insist on um, greater care uh, in the implementation and use of these large language models or generative AI systems uh, when you get into high risk territory? And it gets even more complicated now because they are uh, multimodal. It's not just text that's being produced. Sometimes it's video, sometimes it's imagery, sometimes it's music. Uh, all of which has uh, at the edges an intellectual property issue because of the way these things get um, trained. They may disgorge something which some parties anyway might consider is infringing. So that's occupying some of my time. And a related thing, in addition to the safety question, is the provenance question. Uh, knowing where something came from uh, is turning out to be increasingly important. So is identity, by the way, and this is another area of great concern to me. You and I would not want some third party to pretend to be us and take actions on our behalf. So you'd like to make it hard for that to happen. So you don't want identity theft to be easy, you want it to be hard. And so that probably means that when you are identifying yourself to a system that you're using online, you want that system to be very sure that it's you and not someone else. You hear terms like two-factor authentication and strong cryptography and strong authentication, all of which I believe are very important and increasingly important so that uh, these powerful tools don't get used in a way that's harmful to you or your company or your country for that matter. And the uh, a related issue here is integrity of content. And here I'm thinking about material that is, is, um, has been generated and then is altered. Uh, for uh, to misrepresent it. And for that, digital signatures, another form of cryptography is turning out to be important. So I, I keep stressing accountability and um, an agency. That is to say, we should have tools to protect ourselves, but we should hold parties accountable, which may mean, by the way, that um, anonymity is no longer a good norm. A good norm is strong authentication. Certainly, we understand the whistleblower scenarios but often the party to whom the whistle was blown needs to know and, and validate the party is blowing the whistle, even though they may be obligated to keep that party's identity uh, pr private. And uh, we know reporters who have gone to jail to, in, in the course of protecting their sources. Uh, two other things that uh, occupy my time among others, accessibility uh, of the online tools that we use or any computer-based tools is still inadequate, even though we've made some good progress at Google, Apple, and Microsoft, and others similarly. But it's still, a, a uh, in some sense, a distant objective to make all software fully accessible to everyone, regardless of uh, the disability they might, they might have to overcome, whether it's a vision problem or a hearing problem, a motor problem, a cognitive problem. So I'm um, very concerned about that because the more we depend on these online services, uh, the more every person in our society needs to have access to the, those tools uh, in ways that are effective. And then finally, as you well know, um, I spent 25 years working with NASA, now ESA, JAXA, and um, CARI, uh, the Korean Space Agency, on an interplanetary extension of the internet. And this is coming to fruition as well. Uh, we are we're starting to see plans for a return to the moon and eventual missions to Mars. Um, and we're testing new protocols that are capable of operating over those interplanetary distances. So that's, that's a it's kind of a sampling of the things that I'm involved in. And I can tell you it's almost kaleidoscopic in its character, uh, but uh, it's, it's equally exciting. I just amazed and marvel at this. And uh, my two reactions are, if I had to choose how to allocate your time, one of the big brains and big hearts of the internet, that, that's a nice list. <laughs> the second thing is you're acting like any good parent. The thing that you birthed matters so much to you that you are tending to its care many, many years after your first involvement with it. So uh, it's just stunning to me. 
Uh, well, one of the the things that has made my life is, is studying the internet and now uh, artificial intelligence. And we've launched at Elon University, the Imagining the Digital Future Center to try to be a force for public good, doing primary research in, about digital life. And we hope to be useful to people like you and the general public and policymakers. So I wonder if you talk a bit about the kind of research and data and evidence you think would be helpful as you do your own work in advancing the many things you just described, the benefits of technology and building policy to make sure the worst doesn't happen. Well, first of all, I would welcome uh, such a center, uh, people who have the time to think hard about what the future holds and the consequences of the technologies that we're rolling out. Uh, in some cases, we seem to be rolling them out, uh, you know, we're out in front of our skis and headlights in terms of what the outcomes are. We've all been very surprised by the emergent properties of the Internet itself, the social media, for example, which have turned in many cases uh, very toxic. Uh, were not necessarily anticipated. Uh, spam wasn't anticipated with email either. And of course, that's a 50 year old development and spam is with us uh, and probably will be forever because uh, nobody's going to start charging for email as near as I can tell. Um, so let's think about some of the things you could usefully look into. Uh, one of them, of course, uh, is virtual and augmented reality. Uh, recent products coming out of Apple, of course, just emphasize the interest that people have in that. Uh, the reason that uh, augmented reality is so uh, interesting to me is that um, it really does offer an opportunity to take information that we know about the world and present it to you just when you need it. It's not too different than the turn-by-turn -turn notion that Google Maps uh, and Waze uh, have. You get the information exactly when you need it, and it's useful because of that. So some of the AR stuff uh, might turn out to be very much worth uh, your attention. Uh, another thing which you've heard me rant about is that uh, digital content is not necessarily guaranteed to last forever. The digital media themselves are not very uh, resilient over time. How many, and even if the bits are still on the magnetic medium, uh, can you find a reader for it? You know, how about a three and a half inch floppy disk? How about a five and a quarter inch floppy disk? How about a, CD, a DVD or a CD-ROM? Some of the machines that used to have readers for those don't have them anymore. Uh, I had to go out on eBay to find a three and a half inch floppy reader so I could figure out what the hell was on this dust gathering pile in my, in my basement office. So digital preservation over long periods of time is a topic of real concern because those records may turn out to be important and valuable real estate records, for example, other transactional things, important documents, wills, all those sorts of things may need to be preserved for long periods of time, even after you're dead. Uh, security continues to be a huge issue for me and something that you should pay attention to. Quantum computing, of course, is a big investment at Google and elsewhere. Uh, and I think that as you're looking towards the future, what would it mean to have successful quantum computation? Um, I think the best way for you to think about it is to remember what VisiCalc was like back on the Apple IIe or Apple II Plus. It meant that you got real-time spreadsheet interaction, which meant you could explore future spaces by changing parameters and saying, what happens if this parameter changes to that? And you got an answer right away. And so you could explore this future space uh, you know, in real time. And imagine now for some optimization problems, you couldn't do that with a conventional computer, but you could do it with a quantum computer. And so the VisiCalc for the quantum machine might turn out to be a you know, really an amazing turning point where you exercise that computing power to look at optimization problems in real time, exploring solution spaces that would otherwise take you uh, many lifetimes uh, to, uh, to calculate. Speaking of calculation, computational X would be another place that I would focus your attention for many different values of X, computational linguistics and biology and chemistry and astrophysics. We're all in the scientific world relying increasingly on models that we can run on our computers to help us either analyze data that we've collected or maybe uh, attempt to uh, model the way we think the way we think things were generate data which we then have to confirm or not uh, when we do actual measurements so computational x for many values of x would be appropriate we've already talked about generative ai there's plenty of opportunity there and it wouldn't hurt for you to look into accessibility as well for all the reasons i mentioned earlier and that's just uh, you know one small list. Uh, we haven't talked about finance, for example, and 
uh, helping people keep track of, of what's going on in their lives, uh, maybe even using um, some artificial intelligence devices to help you do things that otherwise you'd have to do on your own. I, you know, I wouldn't mind having an intelligent assistant, and there are many people, including Google, that are pursuing that goal. Uh, we have a little service called the Google Assistant, which tries to be useful in helping you organize your life. It's um, first of all, it's a great research question list. It's a, also a great set of imaginings about the way things are going. Um, in a report that we have just issued about the future impact of artificial intelligence out of my center, you wrote about the greater avail availability of AI tools and how the normalization of AI systems would pose what you called dual use challenges where bad actors could exploit the capabilities of these tools just as easily as good actors could. And I just wanted to invite you to say a bit more about the risks you see us ahead and how they might be addressed. Well, ironically, I just finished uh, a two-day meeting uh, at, um, uh, what is it called? Sorry, I'm drawing a blank, the Annenberg Estate Sunnylands that was hosted by the National Academy of Science. And here we were talking about science and, uh, and uh, generative AI, and the questions came up, well, how do we deal with the, with the possibility that scientific paper, papers are being generated or at least in, infused with content coming from chatbots, uh, which may look good on the surface, but not actually be uh, correct. Uh, and th then there was even some discussion about deliberate falsification of data. One example was given where the data uh, was sparse, and so uh, a uh, artificially intelligent system was used to estimate what the missing points were. So now it's, fabric it's fabricated data, and I don't mean to say that it was uh, that in the negative sense. I mean, it was not an un unreasonable attempt at doing interpolation of the available data, but it is artificially produced interpolation. So now that data gets into the literature, and then people start building on that, and you start to get worried about, well, shouldn't it have been clear that some of the data points in this thing had been generated by interpolation, that they weren't actually gathered by the, the measurement process? Uh, and so this question about visibility and transparency of the use of these tools in the course of scientific work uh, struck us as an important issue to be dealt with. Um, and this also uh, gets to, um, the more deep problem of using these systems to make recommendations of one kind or another. Uh, how much should you trust the, uh, the advice that comes out? And so we, uh, I, I couldn't possibly um, summarize two days worth of discussion, but I think there was a very strong desire for um, transparency and visibility of the use of the tools uh, in the course of scientific investigation. Uh, I think there was a great deal of uh, concern that, uh, that we identify uh, whether or not such tools were actually used. Um, and we want more ability for, for people's results to be duplicated or replicated by running the same experiment uh, in, a, you know, in multiple contexts. An awful lot of the concern here has to do with the um, ease with which these tools can be used uh, to produce outputs that look good on the surface, but might not actually be substantive. Uh, some of this also gets to software development. You, know, you can get these tools to write software. My first reaction is, well, you better run the software through something that will look for vulnerabilities. Just to, And you should be probably transparent about having used such a tool. To, uh, to produce the output, whether it's a scientific study or a piece of software. So uh, that report will come out not too long from now and be uh, surely of use uh, to the century that you're setting up. Well, thank you for all those insights and, uh, and, and for that deeper explanation. Um, we're, my final question is, is about your final thoughts on the trend lines and technology that obviously are developing the things that you can see over the horizon that will be happening. How, how do you think citizens and policymakers can best prepare for this all? 
Well, I, I think part of it is to understand a little more deeply how dependent they are on software and what properties they want that software to have. And an example is Internet of Things. Uh, I think we mentioned a little earlier that it, it runs on software, basically, that, which makes it so interesting because it's flexible and, and uh, modifiable. But uh, you don't want to offer these devices too much autonomy uh, without some guardrails. Uh, for the same reasons that uh, that you might want to think twice about letting an, uh, a, um, an, an artificially intelligent um, program take actions on your behalf without perhaps checking with you first, as opposed to, you know, uh, tracking s the stock market and buying when it goes up and selling when it goes down. Um, sometimes when that happens, you get this exacerbating effect where the market roars up and then it roars back down again. You get this bang, bang effect. Uh, I worry about giving chatbots autonomy uh, and agency by letting them go and call on other products and services that have real effect in the real world. We're starting to see the generative AI systems reaching out through application programming interfaces to execute things that have real world impact, whether it's spending money or you know raising a drawbridge or whatever else it might be, driving a car. Uh, so I think we should be worried about uh, how much autonomy we offer these things. Uh, and uh, and we also, I think, want to be alert to emergent behaviors and surprises. And finally, I think we ought to have these, these kinds of AI tools explain their output. How did you come to that conclusion? On what basis did you reach that conclusion? Good logic. Uh, so we want guardrails to limit hazardous uh, outputs. Uh, we want strong identity protection for people so that the chatbots can't pretend to be them. We want stronger provenance. I, uh, where did material come from? What data was used to train these things? And I think there needs to be some new social norms. Uh, and this has to do with how these things are actually used or could be abused. Remember that smoking used to be chic and now it's not a good thing and you're only allowed to do it over here. What about seat belts? They didn't exist and until there was pressure given in several dimensions, including the legal side. And, uh, and other social norms, for example, gay marriage was uh, not a thing, you know, not too many years ago, and now it's far more broadly accepted. So I'm wondering what social norms we should evolve in the uh, presence of these online artificial intelligences, and maybe that's something that the center can also uh, look at. Um, because I think that we may need to adapt our social norms to avoid abusive use of some of these powerful technologies. Well, thank you for being my best research um, guider here. Um, and I end where I began. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for your creation. Thanks so much for pouring your heart and soul into this world. Really a pleasure to be with you, Vin. All of that's very kind of you to say, Lee, but uh, in a sense, what you're trying to do with your colleagues is uh, equally, if not more important, because we are where we are. It's 50 years since this project got started. Half a century into it, we realized that there's a lot of work to, be, to do, a lot of implications of these technologies that have real world impact. And so focusing attention, as you propose to do, on uh, the consequences of having these things commonly available is really important to all of us. So uh, like all the others who will be affected by the, these uh, tools and services, I hope that your center is very successful because, uh, you know, what is it they, they suggest that you should, uh, you should support the cancer research because you might save somebody that you care about, including yourself. Yeah, thank you.